colleagues. Uh, I think we can begin. It's uh, 1.30 sharp. Uh, thank you for attending uh, this event uh, and welcome. Uh, as you know, this event is uh, dedicated uh, to um, address uh, the issue, the critical issue uh, that must really remain in the, in the spotlight uh, of uh, the harm of IEDs and non-manufactured uh, weapons. So, um, as you know, these devices represent a lethal threat uh, to civilians worldwide, affecting indiscriminately uh, worldwide lives and communities, and it's also a threat, of course, for military personnel. So uh, France is really committed uh, to continue to raise awareness uh, on this threat, uh, while the attention might uh, be captured sometimes by emerging and disruptive technologies and artificial intelligence, but we still have, of course, to address uh, the threats that entail uh, the major casualties on the ground. Uh, we've worked uh, a for a long time now with uh, our colleagues from Australia and with other countries uh, uh, to table uh, every two years a resolution uh, to address this issue and to maintain uh, awareness and, uh, uh, and political attention. Um, so IEDs uh, have become really the, the weapon of choice for many non-state armed groups and criminals around the world uh, targeting public spaces. It disrupts also humanitarian relief efforts, undermines United Nations and regional peace operations. Um, so IEDs pose a complex and evolving threat that continues to require a coordinated approach and a comprehensive action by the international community. So today's event um, will not only look at recent harm, but mainly will seek uh, to examine the patterns of such harm and also what might be learned from such harm. And to this end, we will be given insight into uh, the 100 most injurious IED attacks in the past decade. And following this, uh, we will look at the gendered uh, nature of such attacks and finally, what impact major explosive events, IEDs, and other forms of explosive harm outside war zones have on the built environment. Uh, so um, I, will, uh, I will introduce uh, each one of our distinguished panelists that I would like to thank again for attending uh, this event and for their pre presentations. So uh, we, we are pretty privileged uh, to uh, have with us, uh, um, and this will be the, the first uh, intervention, Ms. Jenny Dathan, uh, currently pursuing her PhD at Anglia uh, Ruskin University, uh, with her extensive background in researching civilian harm from conflict. Uh, Ms. Dathan will discuss the decade of IED harm emphasizing their significant impact in populated uh, areas. Then we will, of course, hear from uh, uh, Dr. Ian Overton, the Executive Director of uh, uh, Action on Armed Violence, uh, with a career spanning uh, journalism and uh, um, armed violence research. Uh, and today, you will re present recent uh, data on the most injurious 100 uh, incidents of IED harm in the last decade. Our uh, third uh, speaker, Professor uh, Ismini um, uh, Gizelis from the Department uh, of Government at the University of Essex, specializes in conflict dynamics, gender equality, and post-conflict reconstruction. Uh, she will elucidate uh, the impact of IEDs on women, exploring whether women are indiscriminate victims or specific targets of these uh, attacks. And lastly, uh, Dr. Uh, Jack Denny, a well-respected researcher from the University of Southampton uh, in the field of blast engineering, will offer us an engineering perspective on blast injuries uh, through his presentation. Uh, Dr. D Denny will detail methods available to predict patterns of harm the complexities within urban environments, and uh, the importance of informed preparedness and protection. Uh, 
so uh, each one of our speakers uh, brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table, uh, offering us, uh, I think, a very rich uh, exchange uh, also uh, of views and, uh, and discussion. So I will definitely not uh, prolong my introduction because you are here to hear the, the panelists, and I will immediately uh, give the floor uh, to, uh, uh, to Jenny. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and so, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I've been working with this data for the Explosive Science Monitor for over seven years now in some capacity or another. Um, so the, the Explosive Science Monitor records any incident of explosive weapon use that results in at least one casualty. And the data is collected from English language news media and has been operating since October 2010. Um, and with this amount of time collecting data, we can speak to the patterns and trends seen across this time related to explosive weapon use. So what I'm going to present to you today is the, the data we've seen over the last decade and the patterns of harms we've seen as they relate to improvised explosive devices. And I'll also try to touch upon some of the points of concern for future harm uh, from IED use. Um, so as you can see, um, across the last decade, IEDs have accounted for 47% of the total civilian casualties that we've reported to AOV, causing over 114,000 civilian casualties from 11,000 incidents. Um, and from this graph here, uh, you can also see by looking at the civilian casualty toll and the number of incidents that in comparison, IEDs also on average see um, a higher number of civilian casualties per incident. And though of course this is affected by the fact that almost always a non-state actor has been using the IDs and they are more likely to be targeting civilian areas. In fact, civilians account for 78% of total IED casualties um, with more than 114,000 civilians killed and injured by IDs in the last decade compared to 32,000 armed actors. Um, of the casualty causing incidents recorded, 58% of IED attacks occur in populated areas, and these attacks account for 91% of civilian casualties, and this has been consistent um, in t as a proportion of, civilian of the harm across the last decade. Um, the patterns wanted for female civilian casualties um, largely mirror the, the ones we see for the civilians, but they're generally poorly reported in news sources. Nevertheless, the majority of civilian casualties recorded also occur in populated areas. 72% of all reported civilian casualties, uh, female casualties uh, from IEDs occurred in these areas. Although only 7% of incidents provided data on the number of females among the casualties. In the instance that did provide some data on females among the casualties, uh, at least 16% were female. And in instances of suicide attacks, this actually rises to 27%. Um, while the trend in civilian casualties, uh, child civilian casualties, looks a bit different than general civilian casualties, um, it's again difficult to understand the root of this given that children are very poorly identified within sources. But in 2019, uh, we can see this big spike that was caused by um, a few high casualty incidents that did report uh, the number of civilians among them. Um, and the level of reporting for children among casualties is only slightly better with data um, in provided in 10% of the incidents. 84% of child casualties were recorded um, in incidents in populated areas. And among the incidents that did provide some data on child casualties, children accounted for 20% of, of the civilian casualties. Again, among suicide attacks, that rose to 27%. In total, 93%, uh, 93 countries and territories have seen at least one casualty from ID in the last decade, um, which demonstrates the truly global nature uh, and reach of IED harm. Where of these, some have been far more impacted than others, uh, with countries seeing the most civilian harm from IEDs, including Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Pakistan, Nigeria, Somalia, Turkey, Yemen, Lebanon, and Egypt. So we can see the regional impact it's had as well and their prolific use in the Middle East, North Africa, and nearby areas. <coughs> 
Um, as you can see, though, the number of countries impacted by IEDs each year has remained relatively consistent, uh, with some countries, including those mentioned, consistently seeing incidents year on year, alongside fluctuations in other countries. We also want to look at the, the most impacted locations. So here we have the event locations that see the highest number of incidents. So as you can see, almost 3,000 of the incidents have occurred on roads. And this is due to a large number of roadside bomb incidents. And roads are followed by urban residential areas, villages, armed bases, armed bases and markets, and so on. But when we compare this to where we see the most civilian casualties, we can see that despite the number of incidents on roads, for example, relatively fewer in markets, it's markets that have seen the highest number of civilian casualties from IEDs, followed by place of worship, then roads, then commercial areas, and public gatherings. Among these areas um, most impacted are what we refer to as populated areas, where large numbers of civilians are likely to be present, which means high civilian casualties um, are likely to occur from incidents in these locations. So while 58% of casualty causing IED incidents um, have occurred in populated areas, these account for 90% of all civilian casualties. Uh, looking at the yearly rate of IEDs, in recent years at least we've thankfully been seeing the number of incidents falling with a consistent fall since 2018. Um, and this has been matched by a similar fall in civilian casualties from IED attacks. Um, and this trend of falling ID attacks and civilian casualties is likely to continue this year. We also see, um, we also monitor um, the type of ID used, uh, which we break down into these main categories of car bomb, non specific ID, roadside bomb, and attacks where multiple types of IDs are used. Um, and I've also included here the, the others, uh, which is included under this other type. Um, these not only give an indication of the nature of the attack, most used and the level of casualties, but also those that cause the most harm per attack. Um, so you can see that while we've recorded slightly less car bombs and roadside bombs, these have ca caused far more casualties. This is because car bombs are more likely to take place in populated areas, um, be more targeted and with a bigger blast radius. So they generally cause more casualties per incident. The category of other um, has seen only a few incidents in the past decade. We've actually seen this rise quite a bit in the last year, with more improvised devices being air or ground launch, such as improvised mortars, or IEDs dropped from commercial drones um, in certain conflict settings. Um, and this is something we would like to see more of as well. Uh, the IED, IED detonation types recorded um, across the last decade also shed light on the impact of different IEDs. Um, while the detonation mechanism is not routinely stated in the sources, where it is, it can help us to understand the impacts better. So we can see here that those recorded with suicide as the method of detonation, so a significantly higher number of casualties per attack compared to other detonation types. While victim activated generally sees the lowest numbers per incident, um, and those of multiple modes of detonation, which are generally very complex um, incidents and often include suicide detonations alongside other methods, uh, also see high levels of casualties per attack. So given the level of casualties from uh, suicide attacks in the last decade, um, AOV has conducted further research on these types of incidents, and I'll go into a bit more detail on this data. So AOV have recorded suicide attacks across 45 countries globally, so about half the number uh, impacted when including all IED types. Um, and suicide attacks have um, actually accounted for 16% of total IED attacks. However, these attacks account for far more civilian casualties than non-suicide IED attacks, accounting for 48% in total. Um, again, demonstrating the high casualty toll and that is frequently seen from such attacks. On average, four in five casualties of a suicide attack are likely to be a civilian. Um, with civilian casualties counting for 80% of all casualties from suicide IED incidents. Um, this because, in general, suicide attacks are far more likely to be used in populated areas compared to other forms of IED attacks, with 72% of suicide attacks occurring in populated areas compared to 50% of non-suicide IED attacks. 
Similar to IEDs more generally though, the number of incidents have been decreasing in the last decade, more significantly again after 2018. Um, however, we did see slightly more incidents um, in last year. Um, and this, and we could also see a steady increase in suicide attacks this year. Um, so we definitely can't com become complacent about this downward trend. We can also see the fall in civilian casualties for suicide attacks. Those falls have been tailing off since 2020. Um, however, despite the rise in suicide IED attacks, it looks like the level of civilian casualties might continue to fall this year. Um, and this for a variety of reasons. Um, among them is that so far this year, for the first time, armed actors are accounting for the majority of casualties from suicide attacks, particularly in a uh, attack scene um, in Somalia and Pakistan. So this concludes. While it's reassuring to record a fall in ID across the uh, last decade, um, we need to be mindful of the new technologies being used to conduct IED attacks and the new uses of IEDs, um, as well as continue to monitor this recent uptick in suicide attacks in the last year or so. The use of IEDs in populated areas, particularly suicide attacks, uh, remains the incident type most likely to cause the highest levels of civilian harm. And year on year, we continue to see communities subjected to these attacks so despite this fall, there still remains high levels of student harm um, that we continue to record. So thank you for listening and any welcome any questions on the data. But I'll hand it over to the next speaker. I'll do it from, I'll do it from here, Jenny. <coughs> um, thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, and it's sort of a, uh, a, a terrible truth, I think, that our world view is currently maybe captured by great conflagrations of fire on the horizon of violence. And this is Ukraine and obviously what's been unfolding this weekend. Um, but IEDs, I would argue, are the slow burn. Um, if you want to identify the real weapon of mass destruction of the 21st century, it would be the improvised explosive device. In terms of numbers of uh, civilians, it's really harmed. And in terms of armed actors, it's also harmed. And let me give you uh, a, a terrible story to begin with. This is the, uh, the 31st of March, 2013. It was a, a warm uh, uh, Sunday spring evening in Kashmir. Uh, and worshippers were gathering around a mosque, women and children amongst the crowd. A car pulled up, and in an instant, their lives were overturned as the suicide bomber pressed his trigger. Thou hundreds of people were injured in that instance, dozens were killed, and as the ambulances arrived, uh, the, summer, the spring heat dissipated from the day to leave a carnage in that Kashmiri street. And I say this story because all of the elements of that attack are repeated across time and space in IED attacks uh, that have caused terrible injuries. And what I would like to do now is to talk about the most 100 injurious IED incidents we, we, the world has witnessed over the past decade, and to extract from that some of the commonalities that we see that were really there present in that Kashmiri attack, as, I, as I'll show. But IEDs, as we've heard, not only cause around 50% of all civilian harm from explosive weapon use around the world, but they are also incredibly prolific, 93 countries being impacted. A huge number of those countries impacted by suicide bombers. Now, if we were sat at this table in 1973 in the United Nations, we would be able to state that there was not one recorded suicide bomber in the world that year. This year, we've seen dozens in dozens of countries. And the IED often, despite having originated in the propaganda of the deed, the first suicide bomb victim was actually the Tsar of Russia, uh, killed by a Russian revolutionary anarchist. And that propaganda of the deed has almost lost its sting. Uh, I don't know if you would know that there were 33 separate IED incidents this weekend alone in Syria, which obviously haven't made international news for a whole variety of reasons. But we chart every single incident that happens to appear in English language media, and I'd like just to talk you through some of the commonalities 
So the 100 most injurious occurred in 20 countries, and they accounted for almost 25,000 civilians harmed, of which 7,000 were killed. Next slide. In terms of where they took place, they largely took place in non-international armed countries, i.e., this is not Westphalian. This is not state fighting state. This is internal uh, dissent, internal terrorism, internal violence. Uh, um, chronic insecurity, uh, as another subcategory, saw a number, but 86 of the 100 uh, occurred, with 83% of civilian casualties in areas of non-international armed conflict. Next slide. Um, it probably isn't a surprise that around 50% of the 100 most injurious incidents in the last decade occurred within a Salafist jihadist setting, an Islamist uh, insurgency. We did see sectarianism and anti-government actions accounting for around a quarter of the remaining uh, each, but obviously we have been living in uh, what has been loosely termed the so-called war on terror. And I think Salafist jihadism certainly has been behind a great deal of the attacks. Now, why does Salafist jihadism... It doesn't mean the Salafist jihadists are better at making bombs. I think what it means is they are more likely to be employing, under a theological uh, framing, the use of suicide bombings. And as I'll come on to explain, suicide bombings are particularly injurious. They are, has been referred to, the poor man's guided missile. And so if you can decide the time and the place for the detonation of your vest, and you are deliberately targeting civilians, of which many uh, Salafist jihadist suicide bombers do, uh, clearly the in injury levels are going to be very great. Next slide. Um, in terms of areas where these activities have been undertaken. We looked at the UN's own framing of counterterrorism uh, describers, and uh, they're broken down loosely into targeting political um, uh, opposition, US intervention, military operations, um, anti-money laundering or um, uh, actions, or no comprehensive counterterrorism legislation. Of these, the targeting of political opposition uh, accounted for around a half. Uh, and we did see a considerable amount of activity in areas where uh, there was a US military presence in the last decade. Next slide. Um, it probably is not a surprise, given that suicide attacks, because we can't have the forensic analysis of what type of IED they were, they, they become non-specific IEDs. So the non-specific ID dominated because suicide attacks themselves dominated. And some suicide attacks were also car bombs, so that's a separate category. But car bombs and non-specific IEDs uh, were the main feature. Next slide. Now, what really surprised me in the analysis of the 100 most injurious events is that 80% of them were suicide attacks. And I don't think anyone has really ever alighted on this hard reality about the sheer terror that suicide attacks both instigate in terms of fear in the community, but the direct impact it has on civilians. So 80% uh, uh, of all attacks of the 100 most injurious were suicide, and they accounted for around 80% of all civilian casualties. Um, I, if you're interested in um, finding more, and this is a shameless book plug, but I have written a book called The Price of Paradise, which is charting the rise of the suicide bomber in the modern age. And I'm happy to reach out and send you a, a copy if you would want to give me your email address and I get your, your address afterwards. In terms of countries, um, again, if you look at this list, uh, some of the countries that we see dominating the news today are not really present. But Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and Syria certainly have witnessed uh, more than their fair share of suicide attacks. And the number of uh, suicide attacks and IED attacks in Afghanistan still continues, as well as in Pakistan. We've seen some terrible events in recent weeks. Um, but um, again, a salient feature of a lot of these countries 
is that there is still a battle for the soul of the religion in those countries. These are, um, from, an, from a non-Muslim perspective in terms of the breakdown, these are Muslims attacking Muslims, um, Sunnis attacking uh, Shias, and Salafist jihadists attacking uh, subsections of Sunnis uh, groups. Uh, next slide, please. So unsurprisingly, when we look at the most injurious events, places of worship really stand out. And I think this could be a real policy consideration because if you know you're in a country uh, which is witnessing high levels of ID attacks, places of worship uh, um, are, in, are of target and are of note. Um, often urban settings is uh, another element. Uh, this is partly because a lot of these attacks are deliberately targeting civilians. And so why would you go to an area where there are not many civilians? So urban, obviously, uh, has a major feature, as do public gatherings and markets. So um, I think that this lends itself towards a consideration of um, public safety and security, particularly if you're interested in mitigating future harm. Next slide, please. Um, interestingly, we looked at the weather in these attacks, and we came to the conclusion that if it was roughly between 26 degrees and 35 degrees, so quite balmy and warm, people were out uh, walking the streets, enjoying maybe a, a, an evening air, and that is when suicide bombings and attacks usually struck. So the warmer the point, uh, the more injurious there are, which possibly also represents the areas where we're often seeing these attacks. Um, but when the temperature either drops or goes above uh, the, 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 the 40 degree mark, uh, we see numbers of incidents sharply falling off. So cold and hot, very hot days are um, less likely. Having said that, um, I think it is also worth noting that going forward, we may well see IED attacks related to climate change. So very hot weather may cause more IED attacks. That's conjecture, but I think it isn't a naive one. Uh, next slide. Um, sim similarly, we also noted that um, IED attacks were far more likely to occur during the weekend days of Saturday, Friday, and Sunday. Uh, again, this might be because families are out on force. This is where marketplaces are packed and religious sites are visited. So it could be that the targeters decide that that's the best time to strike because that's the greatest mass of people in a single location. Uh, but lower levels on the Thursdays, Tuesdays, and very comparatively only 10% on the Wednesdays. Thank you. Um, the Islamic State, perhaps unsurprisingly to those who have followed geopolitics over the last decade, caused uh, the vast majority, around 50% of civilian casualties caused by the Islamic State. This was uh, an organization that almost mechanized the suicide vest. People found, uh, there were found suicide vests with uh, serial numbers on them because they were being mass produced. Um, they coordinated their attacks, so sometimes they would have three simultaneous suicide attacks at the same time, followed by uh, a land attack where individuals would be wearing suicide vests as well. So this combination of mass manufacturer vests, an ideology that believed that in order to succeed, they had to die, uh, which was rooted in a kind of messianic vision, as well as uh, a strategic and tactical use of suicide bombs has meant that the Islamic State, at least in recent years, uh, probably more time than any other point in history, have used the suicide bomb as a, as a regular weapon uh, rather than a discrete or, in, or a singular one. Next slide, please. Well, um, hopefully that gives you at least an, uh, an outlier. We are going to be publishing uh, um, this report um, in November, uh, where we'll be presenting it again um, in New York and Geneva with the kind assistance of the French government. Um, but now, uh, without further ado, I will pass over to my good friend, uh, Professor Yasmini Giselis from the University of Essex, who will be able to contextualize some of these major incidents through the prism of gendered violence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so, 
as Ian said, uh, this is a project, uh, Mass Casualties and Gender, with my colleague Sarah Paul and Brian Phillips, where we use uh, the data from action armed violence, but we give a gender perspective. So this presentation will cover basically the explosive violence against women, uh, some uh, descript descriptive uh, evidence, then we're going to look at um, what are possible drivers or mitigating factors, and then where does that take us in the future. So when it comes to extreme violence, one thing that we often observe, or quite frequently in recent years, is that uh, women become the victim. And this is across countries that have armed violent conflict and countries that do not, like the UK, for example, a country that I've been living for the last 18 years. The Manchester is the Ariel Grande uh, concert uh, where most of the attendees were teenage girls and it was one of the most recent uh, major incidents in the UK. So that shows you the wide range of areas where women might become victims of explosive violence. So that what suggests is that not all civilians are targeted equally. In fact, women face unprecedented levels of targeted political violence, and this is recorded not only on the AOV data, but also other data sets such as ACLED. Now, what we are interested in here is the use of explosive devices against women, uh, which is not random. In other words, we observe clear patterns. There is a lot of variation across time and space. And even more important, we observe variation across actors within countries. Some groups restrain for actually using violence against women, others do not. Unfortunately, there's very limited understanding about such violence, and I'm going to discuss a little bit the reasons for that. So how do we capture ex uh, explosive violence against women? So we use three indicators, three ways to measure it. The first one is explosive attacks on feminine gender spaces. Now, the data is uh, thankfully geocoded, which means we can actually, with precision, identify where they take place. And what is a feminine gender space? This is a term that derives from uh, the sociology and the feminist literature. These are spaces that, on average, women tend to be present. This does not mean that they're at home. Um, and I'll, I'll get into this uh, point in a second. But there might be spaces that because of how societies are organized, that women might be more uh, frequent. And this is, again, across the board. It's not just in particular patriarchal societies. Even if you think about Western countries, if you go to a school, like my daughter, in her nursery, there was one male teacher. In her primary school, again, there's one male <laughs> teacher. So these are spaces that predominantly women are present. And when we observe attacks in such spaces, that raises the question not about whether the victims are women, but whether the intention of targeting these spaces was to target women. Traditionally, in the disaster literature, there are observations that the victims tend to be women, especially if you think of earthquakes or flooding, and they tend to be in the home. This is about victimhood. Now we want to move beyond that, and we are talking about intentionality. The second indicator we use, we look at explosive attacks where the majority are female victims. And the third one is the share of female victims. As Jenny has already mentioned, in some cases, the, victim, the female victims might be 10%, 15%. In other cases, might be 60%, partly because of the location. So when someone makes that decision, clearly there is an awareness of who the victims are going to be. And this kind of intentionality we want to explore and understand. So just to give you an idea, when we look at the global distribution of the um, explosive violence against women, 
the central map is, shows globally, and the darker is the color, the higher the frequency of attacks where women are the majority of victims. The two other uh, maps, the top one shows you uh, the explosive violence in conflict countries and the second one in non-conflict countries. So this is again a phenomenon that is not unique to a countries that have experienced conflict in a particular year, but rather uh, quite global. And this is a, a list of the top 10 countries. The green one are countries that have experienced, they, are under, uh, they have experienced in conflict. The uh, pink are countries that do, are not in conflict. So why this is important? As I mentioned already, this is an overlooked area of gender-based violence. Most of the research focuses on sexual violence or domestic violence against women, which is unfortunately on the rise even among European countries. And this growing interest on sexual violence and domestic violence against women, uh, although it's a very important, tends to uh, ignore other forms of violence, such as the use of explosive weapons. And that, at least uh, among academics, comes from the fact that we are a little bit blindsided, assuming that often violence is against civilians is gender neutral. And this is basically what we want to challenge to some extent. So this is how uh, the cases of explosive violence against women when women are more than 50% of the victims. Again, the darker is the color, the more frequent such attacks uh, in a given year uh, against women where the majority of victims are women. It's also important to understand that this is a different type of violence for several reasons. First of all, it's perpetrated by strangers, often outside the home. As I said, that's very important to understand the concept of a feminine uh, space. It's distinct from sexual violence because it does not involve sexual attacks, but is extreme because it's impersonal. And it has devasta devastating impact for survivors and serious implications for development. Now, uh, Jack, is going, as an engineer, is going to explain what happens to so-called survivors of such attacks when they're injured. But for women especially, in certain contexts, they get stigmatized, directly impacting not only themselves, but also their families and their communities, and therefore broader questions of development. And yet, this is an under-researched area. So when we look at drivers of higher or lower levels of explosive violence against women, we look at women's empowerment, and we use different ways to capture that from uh, gender index to percentage of women who are participants in the labor force, women who are participating uh, in uh, m members of the legislative bodies, as well as women who occupy senior positions in governments. And what we observe is that the higher is the level of empowerment for women, the lower the likelihood and frequency of explosive attacks against women. And this is for three reasons. First, higher levels of empowerment reflect different patterns of social and organizational an economic organization within societies. This is not a new argument. Esther Bozerop developed this concept of how agricultural societies were organized, reverberate through the centuries uh, to their uh, institutional structures today. It also reflects a protective value system. And here, we are turning the norm of protective of civilians to its head, because we argue that it, this protection is present when women have a higher status rather than in very patriarchal societies. And we argue that that can change the calculus of perpetrators as to whether that will be uh, an attack that targets women will be positively or negatively perceived depending on who, are, who is the audience of such acts and such perpetrators. So again, if we go back to our maps, the purple is the uh, levels of gender equality, the darker is the more equal society, and the size of the red dot signifies the frequency 
of, uh, in a given year, of explosive uh, attacks against women. Usually, it's highly associated, the larger is the dot, with lower levels of uh, gender equality, and similar applies to female labor participation. And just to give you uh, a brief idea, on average, a country will encounter explosive uh, violence around 10% of the time in a given year, regardless of whether it's a conflict or non-conflict country. If, however, uh, women's employment uh, as percentage of labor force b falls before, below 40%, such a country will experience above average level of explosive attacks. Also, if the gender equality index is above point 0 0.75, such countries will ex ex um, ex expect to have lower levels of uh, explosive violence. When it comes to conflict countries, the likelihood of experiencing um, explosive violence increases by threefold. It's around 30% in a given year. If a country that, has ex that experiences conflict has a female labor participation that is below 20%, then they should expect also to have attacks that exceed this threshold of 30%. That's very high if you think about it. What's the likelihood of an event happening? Similarly, if the gender equality index falls below uh, 0 0.5, then they will expect again to have higher levels of explosive violence than uh, the baseline. So we believe that this type of studies matter for several reasons. First of all, because explosive violence has such severe ramifications for societies overall. Second, this type of global data can give us more nuanced outlook of risks, risks for both men and women. And trying to understand that not all civilians are targeted equally is a first step to be able to understand what kind of mitigating factors we can put in place in order to improve outcomes. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Um, and now we're going to my next esteemed colleague, Dr. Jack Denny, from the University of Southampton, and a member of the International Blast Research Network, IBRN, uh, which is uh, a coalition of which AOAV is a partner, and I really encourage you to, to look out for their work and uh, their engagement. Over to you, Jack. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Ismene. Uh, I'm Dr. Jack Denny from the University of Southampton, and I'm pleased to be here today to give you a presentation about some of the consequences of these devastating attacks that we've been speaking about um, this afternoon. So I'm going to be speaking about the blast injury patterns that we see in the urban environment, and I'll be talking about that from an engineering perspective um, based on my research background. So just an overview of this presentation. Um, I'm going to give you an engineering perspective on the challenges of urban blast events. I'll start off by talking about the different methods out there to predict patterns of harm. Then I'll discuss the complexities that are associated with the urban environment. And lastly, a case study where I discuss some real data looking at blast injuries from a real large-scale explosive event in an urban area. And just a short disclaimer, um, these, uh, this presentation reflects my views only, not my institution, and also some of the data has been um, some details are missing uh, due to the sensitive nature. So first off, um, I just want to describe um, the theory of what a blast wave is and, and how um, they cause blast injuries. So here's a schematic just showing for a, a very idolized explosion in an open area with no obstruction. We see the shock wave propagates out um, and we see that as it propagates out, you would be able to measure a pressure signal that looks something like the figure um, on the bottom right. We see an instantaneous rise in pressure, and that decays over time. And the key parameters in the way that we describe a shock wave in an ideal sense is the overpressure, which is the maximum pressure, the positive phase duration, which is the length of time that that pressure exists, and the total impulse is that shaded area underneath the curve, and that represents the total energy of the blast wave. Now these parameters, they all vary depending on how far away you are from the blast or what we call the standoff distance. 
Um, and it also, of course, depends on the size of the explosion, so the explosive charge mass here. And I put equivalent there because um, in blast engineering, we tend to equate things to TNT. And in reality, when we look at IED attacks, there are multiple forms of explosive charges out there, and they're homemade, and they vary in their, in their energies as well. Now, if we take this very idealized case, uh, predicting these loading effects um, at different distances is actually relatively easy and accurate to do. And there are prediction methods using empirical formula and um, spreadsheets where we can predict these parameters very well and very accurately. Now, about blast injuries. Uh, for those who aren't aware, blast injuries is a complex method of trauma caused by explosions. Um, actually, there are several mechanisms at play here. We tend to categorize these individual mechanisms from primary to, through to quaternary injuries. Now, primary blast injuries, they include things such as pulmonary lung injury, eardrum rupture, and traumatic brain injuries. And these injuries are caused um, directly by the high pressure of the shockwave itself. Secondary blast injuries, these include things such as lacerations, penetrating wounds, and this is caused by debris, glazing fragments, um, and it's caused by these uh, fragmentation injuries, sometimes from the weapon itself as well. Tertiary blast injuries, these include fractures, crush, blunt trauma, and these are caused by um, literally being thrown by the blast winds against hard objects or surfaces, and it also includes things such as structural collapse. And finally, quaternary blast injuries, these are typically burns uh, caused by the explosive fireball and those high temperatures there. So it's a complex taxonomy of different blast injury mechanisms. Now, if I just focus on primary blast injuries, uh, those which are caused directly by the shockwave, predictive blast injury criteria have been developed um, over the years which relate your risk of getting one of those injuries based on the level of blast loading exposure um, that, you, that you have. So if I start off with this graph, this is um, a study I did uh, two years ago, where on this graph, on the vertical axis, we have peak pressure. Along the horizontal, it's the duration of that pressure. Those gray lines represent different combinations of pressures and durations you'd expect to see for different charge masses. And you can see that through from 10 grams through to 1,000 kilograms. And I've picked the 10 kilogram uh, line as an example. You can see at those different distances, they are the levels of pressure and duration you would expect to see for a very idealized case. Now, what we can do is begin to overlay this chart with different injury criteria. And we can see here, so these blue curves represent pressure thresholds where you would expect to see eardrum rupture. We can then look at more serious injuries, such as these red curves, and these represent lung injury. These are the original Bowen curves from, from many years ago. And also a curve there representing mild brain hemorrhage risk as well. So when we begin to overlay the blast physics with the injury criteria, we can begin to see at certain distances, um, certain injuries will be probable. Now I've picked um, also these charge sizes, they, co they correspond to different scale um, explosive threats. So the yellow area represents a landmine type threat through to the larger um, threats of vehicle IEDs, where uh, typically the charge could be over 100 kilograms of TNT equivalent. If I just focus on the orange area for a moment, given that this event is about IEDs, um, this is quite a broad range, uh, can be anything from 1 to 50 kilograms of TNT. And if we look at um, this particular curve for 10 kilograms of TNT, this could represent, say, a, a rucksack bomb or a suicide bomb. We can begin to see at these different radial distances, we get different risks of injury. Now, obviously, close, we see uh, fatality is a very high risk, but even um, up to nine meters away, we can see risk of eardrum rupture and lung injury. So the point I want to make is that by combining blast loading with injury criteria, we can begin to look at these, um, these predictable patterns of harm. Now, this, the limitations of this, of course, is that it's just primary blast injury, and of course, it assumes very idealized blast threats. And when we move to look at blasts in the urban environment, things become far more complicated um, to predict. And what I mean about blasts in the urban environment, we have examples on the left-hand side such um, are confined environments. And this is where attacks happen inside buildings or within transport. And this confinement magnifies the blast pressures and is far more deadly. We also have explosions which occur in the urban environment. As you can see, some examples on the right-hand side. And this is where we see multiple obstacles, reflective surfaces, buildings, and different urban layouts 
Um, and this could be, again, uh, examples such as industrial accidents, terrorist attacks, or other explosive violence. Now, the, the key point here is that this surrounding environment can greatly modify the loading conditions from the simplified, idealized assumptions I introduced earlier. And as a result, this means that we can no longer predict blast loading uh, readily using our simple predictive measures, such as just distance. Now, to look into this problem a bit further, I've done some research uh, using both experimental testing and computational fluid dynamics. And we have three scenarios here where I've looked at four different locations, starting from the left, an open field area. Then in plan view, you can see we now have a building corner. Some of those areas are located behind the corner, and one is directly exposed. And then finally, a more complicated um, scenario where we have this additional wall as well. Now, if I just give you an example, if we look at um, pressure gauge A here, you can see we move from quite an idealized blast wave on the left-hand side to something that's far more complex uh, when we have these additional obstacles and buildings involved. We have multiple peaks and also higher pressures. Now, we see that because of these additional reflections. We get channeling between different buildings. And this leads to increased pressures and impulses of up to 60% in the case of this study. And that corresponds to a higher risk of injury. If I look at a different pressure gauge, so looking at the gauge B1 indicated in green here, you can see that by being located behind the corner, we actually see a decrease in pressure. When we look at the example on the far right, though, where there's the additional wall, we end up with a much more complex profile. So we do see a reduction in pressure compared to the first example. However, we end up with multiple peaks and an extended impulse. So while the pressure is decreased in some examples, the complexity of these blast waveforms also sometimes have higher impulse, which is also higher injury risk as well. So it's not just as straightforward as saying uh, shielding behind the building will protect you. It's not as straightforward as that. And what else uh, we see is that actually predicting injury becomes far more complicated and less reliable for these urban scenarios. And further work needs to look at how can we predict this um, more reliably. Now, if I just summarize uh, some of the theories I've kind of discussed so far, is what I like to call the blast event chain. And I'll discuss about some of these challenges. Now, working across from the left-hand side, Obviously, if we understand what size the explosive threat is, we know how far away we are, and we also understand what the environment is, we can begin to work out what um, blast loading we can, we can expect um, for this particular event. If we know the blast loading, we can begin to think about what is the blast injury risk, and that could be different injury mechanisms. We can also think about structural damage as well. What degree of glaze, uh, glazing failure can we expect to see, and how far out do we expect to see that? And it's really important that we, A, know the loading and then know the injury risk and the structural damage in order to inform preparedness and protection. So if we're trying to estimate the number of casualties during a response, or if we're doing a risk assessment, or if we're trying to uh, advise on sheltering, um, we need to know uh, the injury risk. And then likewise for protection, we need to know safe distances, window specifications, how can we inform better urban planning and advocacy to try and mitigate and reduce this harm? And all of that stems from understanding the threat um, as well. Now, the challenges of this, um, understanding this in urban areas is incredibly complex. And I've already mentioned the injury criteria limitations. The solution speed is often crucial as well. If we're looking at responding to events, what level of detail is enough? And of course, there's many variables in this complex challenge varying different types of buildings, window configurations, people's positions when an attack occurs, and of course the risk of structural collapse. There's so many factors. Um, the other thing to note, of course, is that existing science in this area, looking at blast and blast injury, is hugely defense focused at the moment. And this is not always translatable to the civilian context. This is something that we feel very strongly about at the IBRN as well. So further research and data collection is therefore essential. Now, building on from the theory, um, while there are obviously gaps in some of these uh, predictive methodologies, one thing we can do is look back at existing or prior events and try and understand a little more about how those injuries occurred and look for patterns that may exist. So I'm going to present a case study of a very large urban blast event. Uh, this is a forensic study into a previous um, explosive event that happened very recently, and I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors there as well. Just to give you a bit of background about this, uh, this study, 
Now, previous studies have gone and looked at this event and collected blast injury data. However, we didn't know at the time where those victims were located. There is endless medical records with their home address, but we cannot assume that those people were located at their residential address at the time of the blast. So I said we need to try and find out where these people were at the time accurately. So this study tried to investigate their injury patterns and the severity of their injuries and tried to determine were these linked to their distance from the blast and other spatial factors that you would find in the urban environment. So we recruited participants from existing injury studies um, and we asked them to complete a structured interview. During that interview, one of the questions was uh, trying to determine their location. We used Google My Maps and this was helped by using the interviewer's uh, stro uh, strong local knowledge. We ended up placing positions on a map where these people were located at the time. And because there was this two-way conversation, we could actually uh, verify these exact locations, I would say, to the nearest 20 meters of accuracy. So very accurate. Just to give you an overview of some of the results. So out of this study cohort, most of those victims were located in inside spaces, 81%, and 19% were located outside. The three most common injury patterns were soft tissue injuries in blue, musculoskeletal injuries such as fractures in red, and laceration and penetrating injuries in the kind of green color. We've uh, disaggregated those into outside and inside spaces and some patterns emerge. We see that lacerating and penetrating injuries were similar for both outside and inside spaces, about 90% in, in both spaces. However, when we look at the number of musculoskeletal injuries such as fractures, these are more serious, more tended to occur outside than inside, so 33% versus 20%. Soft tissue injuries, they were also higher in outside spaces compared to inside. Now the reason for this, it could be because there was greater blast exposure in an outdoor space. Um, it could be that the blast winds were higher, causing people to be uh, thrown against surfaces or fall over, or simply because there's larger projectiles and debris outside. And you can see in that video there, the nature of some of the hazards by being outdoors at the time of the blast. When we looked at these injury patterns versus distance from the blast, we see that there's a high prevalence of lacerating injuries at all distances. However, when we get closer to the blast, the prevalence of musculoskeletal injuries and soft tissue injuries were much higher. And again, this is likely to do with higher blast energy, higher blast, blast winds, which were capable of throwing people against obstacles. We also asked people about the spaces that they were in at the time, the room aspect, and whether that room face the blast or uh, contrary, it would, be, it would be behind the blast or to the side. And what we found is that the majority um, or 63% of those with lacerating injuries, that was in occurring in rooms that face the blast. Um, so what we see is that rooms that face the events are more likely to have lacerating injuries. And this is likely to do with the fact that glazing breaks and is thrown inside the room due to these high velocity blast winds. Now room aspect again could be helpful for informing responses or prioritizing protective measures if there's a, a known vulnerability. However, we didn't see a correlation with other injury types. This was purely just for laceration uh, penetrating type injuries. We also looked at the injuries caused by being thrown or hit by objects. Now within this study cohort, 84% of the study cohort were hit by an object. And this is mirrors a secondary type blast injury. Now almost half reported being thrown by the blast which again is like a tertiary blast injury. Now when we begin to look at inside and outside spaces, there's a slight difference in the pattern. We see that for those located outside, there's a larger proportion of people being both thrown and hit by an object compared to those inside. Now being thrown and hit is also associated with musculoskeletal injuries and soft tissue injuries with greater severity. This suggests that being outside at the time is more dangerous. When we look at distance, these um, thrown or hit injury patterns also vary. Closer to the blast, we see that people uh, tend to be thrown, um, and this is due to higher winds. When we move further away, victims mostly report just being hit. Again, this is indicative of the blast physics behind um, the, these injuries. When we look at posture, we asked our uh, participants whether they were standing, sitting, ducking, lying down. We found that standing up was associated with a greater likelihood of musculoskeletal blast injuries and soft tissue injuries. However, there was no other patterns with other injury types. This may indicate that posture does in influence the likelihood of these more severe 
musculoskeletal soft tissue injuries, and this could motivate new research into informing sheltering guidance. In terms of injury severity, we, we looked at the medical records, and we looked at in injury severity scores. Now, this is an anatomical scoring system that provides an overall score for patients with multiple injuries. Now, if you look at the pie chart, we can see that 70% had what are called minor injuries with a score below eight, um, although there are some more severe injuries there as well. When we look at the inside and outside spaces, we can see that the average ISS score was higher in outside spaces compared to inside spaces. So again, suggesting that being outdoors at the time is more dangerous. We also found that there's a higher proportion of the most severe injuries in outside spaces, 21%. Uh, versus 11% inside. When we look at distance, injury severity uh, versus distance from the blast, we can see that the most severe injuries, there's a real cluster that occur closer to the blast epicenter. There are, of course, some isolated cases further out. However, this pattern does suggest that injury severity is strongly linked to the blast energy and, and the blast parameters. And therefore, this is why we need to be able to understand blast loading at different distances. Of course, these are just radial distances. In reality, as I've shown before, when the blast interacts with the urban environment, we see a much more complex pattern of loading. And you can see here the pressure contours from a numerical model overlaid here. This shows how you get these high pressure regions build up between different buildings, and this could influence injuries as well. So this is some ongoing research that I'm looking at at the moment. I'm looking at how the urban environment um, may have modified that loading and does that correlate with the injury patterns that we see in this study. So um, that's some future work laid out there. Some summary um, of the initial findings. We saw that most of the severe injuries occurred close to the blast. Proximity to glazing, room aspect, and posture all were seen to significantly influence the injury types. Now, this understanding is helpful for informing preparedness and protective measures when we think about infrastructure protection and urban planning. It's also useful for predicting injuries and for disaster response, such as prioritizing res uh, resources. And I believe that this forensic, multidisciplinary approach can not only unravel the complex mechanisms of civilian blast injuries in urban areas, but it's also very applicable to previous events that have happened. And I think there's scope to apply this type of methodology uh, to other events that have happened in the past. Now, my final remarks are that blast engineering research can generate new understanding and insights and it helps to quantify these predictable patterns of harm from IEDs and urban blasts. Um, it's also useful for informing mitigation and protection, resilient urban planning, disaster preparedness, and it's about generating this quantifiable evidence for policymaking and advocacy. Now, the complexity of explosive violence at the moment far outweighs current solutions, and this is why I think further research is needed so that we can understand how, why, and to prepare and to protect. Now, solutions, they require, in my opinion, multidisciplinary insight. And also, I think that the blast engineering community needs to be part of the conversation and part of the wider solution. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'd take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> yes, th thank you very much to our panelists. We have just a few minutes. Uh, so if you would uh, like to... Uh, to ask any questions, maybe we can take a few of them. Thanks for the presentations. I'm wondering if the, the first two speakers could just um, conjecture on why the incidence of um, these incidences have been going down in recent years and whether that's been replaced with a different type of weapon um, or if there's any kind of uh, theory to explain that. Um, so there's been some, there's some interesting look, when you look at a, a new terror group forming, um, there's a lot of people um, bought, who buy into the theory uh, that this is an ideal worth dying for. So in the early stages of emerging terror groups, there is usually a spike in suicide bombings of those terror groups that use suicide bombings. Um, then there's two elements. One is that cohort quickly is wiped out, um, uh, sort of a Darwinian uh, cauterizing. And then secondly, um, because often the political gains for which these individuals took, sacrificed their lives aren't met, um, the allure of then going on to die for that organization 
um, lo is, is, uh, loses its shine. So you, you seem to get um, initially a, a, a spike of people willing to kill themselves, and then another spike of people who think, well, if that's a cause worth dying for, I'll die for it. And then you get a rapid drop-off. So I think that what we've seen is basically just a lot of um, influenced young men having died and not a rank to step forward. And because of the particular penetrating impact of suicide bombings, then the less numbers of suicide bombers you get in IS, et cetera, meaning the less, less likely they're going to... Um, other events that aren't suicide attacks will hit the top um, 100. However, um, I, do, I do think that what we're seeing is a, is a new age in a form of, of air warfare that really people haven't discussed that much. And I think the UN is a, is a ripe place to discuss this, which is the evolution of the IED drone. And I, I spoke about this here five years ago uh, at another French sponsored side event. And I think the IED drone is going to be a thing of, of real impact going forward. We've seen it used, um, improvised forms of drones being used against Ukrainian soldiers in Russia. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see it in the coming weeks and months in other areas of the Middle East experiencing high levels of violence. And I think um, it really begins to transform the landscape as to sort of, you know, the notion that air superiority was always for the state. And I think that that is going to be an area of profound interest and, and horror, in a sense. Um, seven years ago, at another French-sponsored side, side event, I, I think it was eight years ago, I said, if it's, not, it's not if, but when, a major European city will be hit by a suicide bomber. Uh, within a week, we saw the Paris suicide bombings. Um, I... I terribly predict we will see major IED drone incidents in European and maybe North American towns targeting civilians in the forthcoming years. And I don't think that police uh, are properly equipped to address some of those because we tend to have viewed the notion of drone conflict through the prism of military response. Very much. Any, uh, any other questions? We don't have much time. Yes, please. Possibly. Also, one question to follow up on, on that, because um, you mentioned Afghanistan with the high numbers, and, and in your explanation, you mentioned there are still suicide attacks. Um, for me, it is very difficult, because the uh, obvious first impression is that incidents have gone down massively. Also, the United Nations has access to many more areas. But my personal feeling, also having been in Afghanistan this year for quite a bit, is that it is just a lack of information because the current government doesn't want to make any of the incidents that happen public and well known. So what is your, your view on, on that, uh, that development there in Afghanistan? Because it is still this big number, number out there. I mean... Obviously, we're trying to do a global monitor and we're looking at English language media sources. So um, it would be challenging to try and change the methodology to try and capture more evidence because we'd end up rendering previous data um, inaccurate. Um, I, think I have two observations. One is I do think that the violence in Afghanistan is underreported, but it's hard to prove in, the, um, um, in, in that framing. But the second element is that... Uh, one thing we've noticed is when wars start off in their early days, we get a lot of granular reporting. So we will get a lot of granular detail on what's happening in Gaza and Israel at the moment. Um, as conflicts progress, uh, the media interest tends to strip off. Uh, foreign correspondents who were on the ground tend to rotate to other locations. Uh, the general global press appetite for the drip feed of news drops off as well and editors get distracted by other conflicts. So we've seen it in Ukraine, a drop off. We definitely saw it in Syria, uh, where a major drop off in international reporting of an event, even though it was being picked up on a national level. So um, it, it, one of the, 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 the concerns I always have when you see a s steep drop off is to say, is this truly indicative of a reduction in civilian harm? Or are there other factors such as access for journalists, ennui, um, editorial influence, and 
just um, the fact that journalists are, um, well, people don't buy newspapers that much anymore, and therefore the foreign desks are underfunded to have lots of people on the ground in areas maybe of low-level but simmering violence that cumulatively um, ends up pushing them up, like Pakistan, into the top uh, 10 of countries impacted. Thank you very much. No other questions at this stage? Okay. So I would like really to, to thank very warmly our panelists. I think that it was a, a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I, my takeaways, uh, uh, apart from the fact that there is a huge uh, impact on civilians, and uh, I mean in 93 countries, as you said, 93 countries affected, uh, that not all civilians are targeted equally. Uh, but beyond that, I think that uh, we could see the value of the, uh, the analysis of data in order uh, to analyze the patterns uh, of harm, but in, at the end, in order to provide recommendations, not only for policy makers, but also uh, for urban planners, as you said, for architects, for builders, and all this uh, in, uh, uh, with the sole intent to save lives. So thank you very much for, for your participation in, in this event. Thank you. And thank you, Ambassador, and the Government of France for sponsoring this event. Thank you. Thank you.